said, be who you are, go on your journey. Sometimes I'm going to go like that. So be ready. I do want Vegas. They don't like one verb. Crazy. High energy can change the world. Energy. Say what I tell you to say. I'll take care of the people. I'm naked under this thing. I'm finding out that it's really working amazingly well. A lot of work with a lot of animals in Las Vegas. Comedy clubs throughout the country. Why? It's something different. They had me up here for an hour and a half so far. Just stand here in front of Mike. That doesn't work. good i'm crazy you heard what he said i've been on television shows movies but now virginia Woo! Ah, uh, my career is skyrocketing ladies and gentlemen i made it here i chose virginia on purpose i'll tell you why i love it here i love it coming down here you know why because this is traditional america here my friends this is old-fashioned james madison america this is thomas jefferson america this is george washington america you know what i love you people, you are what we were. You go to church, you don't apologize for it, and better yet, you hunt, you fish, and you don't apologize for it. I love that about you people. That's America. Oh, not a bunch of people lockstep with the politically correct. Oh, don't shoot the animals, they might get their feelings hurt. Oh, this is Virginia. You people don't even pretend to be animal rights activists. You guys are like, see the bunny, shoot him, eat him, make a hat <laughs> out of the rust. Hey, he's a cute bunny. Yeah, he was a cute bunny. <laughs> Is that a snake? No, that's a boot right there. Put that bad boy on. That's America. Cut it, eat it, wear it. If you got a head left over, don't hide it somewhere surreptitiously. Hang it on your wall. <laughs> That's what I love about you people. I love the South. I, I, I just moved to the South. I lived in Southern California most of my life. I moved to Nashville, Tennessee recently. And uh, I got to tell you something. For those of you who still live under the delusion that all Americans are exactly the same, live in California, then moved to Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> First off, I must say this, so I gotta put in my prompt. I was born in Indiana originally, a very small state called Indiana. That was where I was originally born. I, I never bring that up. I don't know why. I guess it's because every time I've ever said, hey, I'm from Indiana, you know, there's always some guy in the crowd going, Indiana, I'm from her too. Okay. <laughs> you know. And usually we're related. So, um. Try to keep it to myself, but I, I moved to Nashville. It's completely different, and it, it, it made me see the difference between conservative America and liberal America, and in some ways, in subtle differences, in subtle. For example, in California, I noticed uh, it's illegal to smoke in the buildings in California, whereas in Nashville, it's illegal not to smoke in all of the buildings. <laughs> Everybody down so I got like grandmothers in wheelchairs on oxygen smoking, <laughs> watching their three-year-olds on tricycles smoking. Everybody. <laughs> I think can't smoke enough down here. I'm telling you, the state motto of Tennessee is, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of that. <laughs> but they smoked it. I mean, because it's the South. That's what I'm saying, you people. You don't, you grow tobacco, you make cigarettes, you don't care. <laughs> I love that. I love it. It'd be hard growing up as a kid, though, down South. Johnny, you don't get up from there until you finish that cigarette. <laughs> Daddy, I don't like menthol. Hush up, your sister's eating a skull, not saying a word. <laughs> That would be rough, but we're here now. We're here now, and I like coming here. I love the whole South, the Midwest, because you're regular people. You're traditional American. But I got to tell you this, I can't drive here. I cannot drive in Virginia. You know why? You have way too many signs on the freeways, and they're strange and unusual signs. See, I learned to drive in Los Angeles, California. People think LA's hard. LA's easy. Eight billion miles of freeways, one sign, maximum speed, 65. Good luck. Go! <laughs> Not in Virginia. No, you've got way too many signs. And they're never helpful signs. They're always warning you about something that's about to go wrong. <laughs> Weird phenomenon that I didn't know was still happening in the year 2003. And you've gotten used to it and adapted. That's how amazing you people are. I'm not used to this. I'm not hardy enough yet. I don't want to get used to a sign warning me about an animal that might leap out. <laughs> get a zoo for crying out loud. <laughs> First time I see deer cross, I'm like, why did they let them on? If you got deer jumping out on the road, that's not put up a sign problem. That's put up a wall problem. You know what I'm saying? That's dig a moat. That's put them on a leash. Somebody invented barbed wire. Use it, for crying out loud. You got deer jumping out on the road, and you act that like that's normal. <laughs> yeah, it's normal if you live in a cartoon. 
What do they do? Jump out in top hats? Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Ah! <laughs> so I don't know what's happening, because you got deer jumping out periodically. And then you got the cold weather signs. The cold weather signs. Always written in some cryptic shorthand. Apparently only you people can decipher. Bridge, I just before wrote. I'm like, okay. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Where's the rest of the information? They're all past me. I got heat on, snowshoes, a walrus. Help me! The bridge is gonna do something! Look out for deer! My favorite one was watch out for tractors. I mean, I'm no farmer, mind you, but don't they have like a designated, I don't know, field they're supposed to be in? Virginia farmers just run wild periodically. Party! Wait, <laughs> claim, grab a combine. Let's go on the freeway. <laughs> Woo, slow her down. Got this baby up to three. <laughs> Let's go race the Amish. Come on. <laughs> That's right. When all those fails, make fun of the Amish people. <laughs> Why? Because they have no electronic recording equipment to prove I said anything. And if they did, they couldn't plug it in, so what the heck? <laughs> Best they can muster up as a scribe. What did he say, Israel? I do not know Judah. I believe he's just in our chariot. <laughs> Good. Laughter, laughter. We have no idea what's going on over here. <laughs> See, for fertile people, these guys haven't moved, and they're like, they're like stone people. Rushmore, party of four. Rushmore, party of four. <laughs> they get nervous. They get nervous. I know why they do, because they're, they, they, people don't know what is coming next. And that's how life should be, because that's what this country is. It's an amazing country, and it's a country that more people want in than want out. And that's how you can tell if a country's great. Do people want in, or do they want out? And more people want in this country than any other. You know why? Because we're better than all the other countries in the world. And I say that. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that. Better doesn't mean superior. It means better. People want to come in. And that's what it was. That's what made the country great. You know why? Because it was hard to get here. And that's what we need. We need to make it hard again to appreciate the country that you have. Because people came over on boats years ago. That's how they first got over here. Some people came on boats to escape religious persecution. Some people came on boats and they were being persecuted. Other people came just to get away from the life they had. But we're all here now. And after all these generations, we're America. And we got here and it was hard. We took boats and it took months and months and people brought their kids and the kids didn't complain. They threw up a lot, but they didn't complain. <laughs> they just came there and we got here and the entire eastern seaboard was created. That wasn't enough. We had to get covered wagons and we wanted to go west and we kept going and they brought their children. That's how respectful people used to be in this country. The kids would take months, months on the road in covered wagons. They didn't have DVDs. They didn't have radios. They didn't have Game Boys and the kids didn't complain. Plane. They weren't going, are we there yet? You know why? Because there was no there yet. <laughs> but they kept going, and then we created the country, and the country became great. But then we made cars. Cars was one of our downfalls. Why? They're too fast, too safe. What do I mean? Instant gratification. The problem with Americans now. We want everything now, fast, now. We gotta make it hard to get someplace, because when it's hard, you appreciate it when you get there. So we gotta make the cars more dangerous. First thing we gotta do is we gotta start taking these airbags out of the cars. <laughs> airbags! See, these kids don't know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something, buddy. When I was growing up, they used to have dashboards made out of metal. <laughs> you got in a wreck, you paid for it. <laughs> you were weeded out so the good drivers had more room. <laughs> That's what America was. It was hard, but they don't know any difference because everybody wants airbags in this country. Front bag and a side bag and a bag and a bag and a bag. And I don't understand the principle of a bag. I think a bag takes away from personal responsibility. Why should you have a, uh, become a better driver if you know a big soft bag's gonna shoot and out protect you? Defeats the pers purpose. I know, it should be an anvil. <laughs> Suddenly, everybody would be nice to each other. We wouldn't need laws. People would let everybody merge. People might even, oh my goodness, start using their turn signals again. Oh, where was I when the memo came out that turn signals are just an option now in this country? How narcissistic have we become that we're gonna play this game? I'm coming in and out, in and out, weaving in, weaving out. I'm gonna turn left, gonna turn right, but I'm not letting you in on it. 
It's about instant gratification and not respecting common courtesy anymore. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I mean. But the kids don't know what I'm saying. They've always grown up with that front bag and a side bag and a bag. It's like a fun house to get in a wreck in this country. <laughs> Got in a wreck. <laughs> the kids loved it. I don't know what happened. I was listening to radio, talking to you, eating and driving at the same time. What could possibly have gone off? They don't know what I'm saying. I'm not putting you down. How old are you, brother? How old are you right there? 16 years old. See, he's been looking at me like I'm crazy. You know why? He's 16. He's never been in a bagless car. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's always had bags. You probably thought cars have always had bags. You probably thought the Model T had bags. Wasn't sophisticated, just a midget with a paper sack. <laughs> Bags, you know, but you don't know because you've always had them. We made it too easy for you. You've always had a bag, and when they set you in the front seat, you had a big old seat belt. A mandatory seat belt, not me. They stuck me in the front seat. No airbag, no seat belt. You know, protected me? Mom's arm. <laughs> That's all I got. How many crash dummy tests do you think it took for them to realize this ain't working? <laughs> Did it take a lot of analysis for this underground General Motors tape? <laughs> See all these scars on my face? I had to keep going through windshields so you could get airbag technology. <laughs> Does he appreciate it? No. We've made it too easy on the 16-year-olds. He's always grown up with a bag and a bag and a bag and a seat belt. And the first five years of his life, he was in the back seat in a five-point harness car seat so you couldn't get hurt. And you probably learned how to ride a bike wearing a helmet, you big baby. <laughs> my bike, my friends would have beaten me up. <laughs> and they should have. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. Helmets are okay. They help the kids. I'm being facetious. The point I'm making is this. What do helmets represent? There's helmet laws. There's seatbelt laws. How you have to treat, raise your children. I'm the government. And I will raise your kids better than you do. But who is the government now? Pagan. Pagan government. See, we used to be a Judeo-Christian nation, and we had personal responsibility. Not now. No, not now. It's everybody that's going to go another direction. They want to go another direction and always try to fix the external because they can't change the internal. We're making everybody weak. Oh, I know. If you're fat, let's not blame you. Let's sue McDonald's. <laughs> Oh, for crying out loud, hey, if you smoke, not your fault. It's the tobacco company's fault. Hey, if you shoot somebody, not your fault. Let's blame the gun industry. This is the problem when you don't have an ethic of God to stand for. You have to fix the external because you can't change the internal. That's the problem with banning. It doesn't work. First off, when did banning anything ever work? I mean, we banned liquor once in this country. Oh, that worked like a charm, didn't it, folks? <laughs> You couldn't find a drink in the Roaring Twenties, could ya? <laughs> See, that's the problem with the banning thing. It's that people think if they change the exterior, the external, suddenly everybody will be nice to each other. Is it work that well? Well, then I say, why stop there? Let's not ban guns. I know, let's ban crime. <laughs> well, I was gonna shoot that guy, but apparently it's illegal now. <laughs> Guess I'm gonna have to turn to a life of labor. See, that's what we've become. We become a bunch of helmet-wearing people, and they don't understand it. We want to be strong again. Look around. We are the remnants of a group of people that broke away from the most powerful country of the 19th century to become the most powerful country of the 20th century. We are a group of people that have created a country so amazing that we used to be this. You came here, and you could be anything you wanted if you are willing to work hard enough. And now we're people that need a sign warning us that coffee is hot. <laughs> If you live in this country and need to know coffee's hot, put a helmet on! <laughs> These are the, we need helmet laws for the politically correct. We need helmet laws for people that have lost common sense. That's what we need. They need to be wearing helmets every time they treat us stupid because the kids are the ones that suffer. Because in their schools, in the schools, they don't know what to do because they can't change the kids, so they just try to change the law. Self-esteem, that's where it comes from. Self-esteem from psychiatry. Psychiatry from Freud. Freud was an atheist. 
Self-esteem, it sounds like a great idea. Let's all do that. I must love me. I must love only me. And it's good to be care about yourself. But where does the esteem come from? You see, if you just love yourself based on yourself, it leads to tyranny, ego, pride. Where does it come from? Well, I'll tell you what Jesus said. Remember him? The guy we used to go to for absolute ethics and moral in this country? He said, you want to have esteem? You must always esteem others first. You must always esteem others first. You'll have love. Remember the Ten Commandments, the very thing we used as a fulcrum for all the laws in this country that you can't even put in front of a state building anymore? First commandment God Almighty said to humans was, you will love me first. You will put me first because when the creator of matter tells you you matter, then you have purpose and then you have self-esteem. But they don't get it. They don't get it. And so we turn the kids into cowards. Ooh, Johnny can't tie his shoe. Let's not make him learn to tie his shoe in case he's not good at it and feels embarrassed and ruins his self-esteem. Let's put Velcro straps on Johnny's shoe. <laughs> Johnny wants to play in the monkey bars. What if he's not as good as all the other kids? What if he falls and skins his knee? He'll ruin his self-esteem. We must now remove the monkey bars so nobody gets them. Or we'll stick him over here in the grass and throw him some, you know, pineapples and some thinking mushrooms so that if they fall, they possibly won't get hurt. It's become ridiculous. I had monkey bars. You know what they put them over? Asphalt! <laughs> and without a helmet, I might add. That's what I'm talking about. And then the piece de resistance, the antibacterial wipe. <gasps> How have we survived as a species without the antibacterial wipe? Johnny, don't touch it until I mop it down thoroughly with an antibacterial wipe. God forbid you get a germ inside you. A germ. No wonder we have a multi-billion dollar antibiotic industry. We don't let enough germs get inside our kids so their body can learn to fight it off the way kids that God designed it to do. Oh, that's how it's supposed to work. If you really love your kids, the next time they drop a sucker in the dirt, pick it up, blow it off, and shove it back in the mouth the way we had to do. The kids don't know. The kids in shock. You mean you didn't have antibacterial wipes? Sure we did. Mom used to spit in a Kleenex and wipe my face. That was my antibacterial wipe. And look how I turned out. They don't know. So off we go. Trying to create a country of greatness again. And we created all these amazing technology like cars and airplanes. Then we went to airplanes. Airplanes are really fast. Thousands of miles you can go in just a day. It's changed the world. That's where we've made mistakes. We've made big mistakes because I've always flown and I've always been afraid to fly, I'll admit it. You know why? Because human beings weren't designed to fly. We figured out how to do it. Kudos to us. <laughs> Good for us. We all gotta get in planes. But the thing is, after September 11th, people got nervous. Four days after September 11th, I got on an airplane and flew. And I was scared. Because nobody knew what was going to happen. Are they going to blow up planes? Nobody knew what was happening. And I got it. I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. It was interesting to me. It was the first time in my life I realized something. Somebody had come into my country and told me, I'm going to make you stop being American. You can't travel anymore. You can't go talk where you want to. I'm going to change your life. And I thought to myself, I'm no way. If I get on that plane and die, and I don't want to, I died for my country. It's the first time I've ever been put in a position where I could die for my country. And that's worth dying for. And then I realized somebody got on that plane and blew it up because they believed in a God different than mine, a God that might try to coerce you into an ideology instead of simply offering it to you. And I don't believe in that type of God. So if I died, I died for my God. And my family, who I would miss and who would miss me, would see that I tried to have integrity and character. So I died for my family. God, nation, family. It was worth it. If you don't have something worth dying for, you got nothing worth living for. Your life is meaningless. That's the point I made, so I got on the plane, and I was scared. But I felt good, you know why? Because finally, I could be afraid to fly, and nobody could make fun of me. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, this was an amazing thing. It was so ironic. I got on the airplane, and I actually realized I was longing for the days when the only thing you had to worry about was crashing. <laughs> Suddenly, this was a good thing. <laughs> now I gotta worry about the guy next to me lighting his shoe on fire. A shoe bomb. Who's teaching these people? Maxwell Smart for crying out loud? <laughs> so I got on the airplane and off I went. And that's the thing I'm trying to make. Why don't the airlines just acknowledge that we're afraid? Why don't they just be that honest? Hey, have a great trip. You'll probably make it. 
because you probably will. You usually do. But what do they say? They try to make you not afraid using that patronizing statistic. Oh, it's safer to fly in a plane than driving a car. Oh, safer to fly in a plane driving a car. Safer to fly in a plane driving a car. I'm like, yeah, what about the other step? The one that says it's safer to crash in a car than it is in a plane. What about that one? Because that's the stat that matters. You get in a car wreck, they go, hey, anybody hurt? Get in a plane wreck, they go, hey, anybody recognizable? <laughs> car wreck, you're a vegetable. Plane wreck, you're a mineral. Isn't that sweet? That's good news. <laughs> Let me be afraid. They're such hypocrites. They tell you not to be afraid to crash. What's the first thing they teach you on an airplane? How to crash. <laughs> they actually tell you to put your hands over your head like this is going to keep you from blowing up. <laughs> Does it work that well? Because if so, I'm using it every time I'm in danger. Give me your money, I'll shoot you. No, 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 I'm doing this thing. <laughs> and some people live. Some people crash and live. Why? You think they're the only ones that remember to do this move? That must blow them away when it works. We're going down. <laughs> You know why they're always teaching me how to crash? Oh, yes. Well, now, don't be afraid to crash. But if we do, we have exits everywhere. Two of the wing, two there, two there, one there, two there. I got like a notepad. Where? What? Over the wing? That's what came off, probably. And they think you've got to be so rational in an emergency. Yes, when the plane crashes, we're all going to go out of this three-by-three three door. No, let's be honest. If the plane goes down, we're going out of the area of the plane that isn't there anymore. And by the way, everything in an airplane actually doubles for something else. Have you ever noticed that? No matter what it is, it's something else. It's like Salvador Dali designed this thing. Well, we have a flotation device, but really, it's your seat. <laughs> I've never seen a guy drowning ever with a lifeguard going, throw him a chair. <laughs> guy comes surfing on a recliner. Dude, appreciate it. Cool. I don't <laughs> Man, my seat is my flotation. I'm saving my peanuts. Maybe that's my life raft. I don't know. teach you how rational we're all going to be in case of danger. And then they have the audacity to teach you how to buckle your seatbelt because it's so complicated. <laughs> Anybody out here can't work a seatbelt? Kill yourself. <laughs> you are a burden on society. <laughs> Cry it out loud if you get on an airplane in the year 2003 and don't know how to work your seatbelt, put a helmet on. Cry it out loud. So I got on the airplane and I flew and I've made it this far and I'm gonna keep going because I believe in my country and I believe in the freedom it, it, it entails. And thank God I've made it so far. And I do thank God, I'm a theist. I'm a theist, I do believe that there is an intelligent designer. I do believe there's purpose and value in life. And I bring up God a lot in my show. You know why? Because I miss him. I miss God in my country. I miss him. You'll never know these things. You're 16 years old. You've grown up with spring break, not Easter break. You grew up with winter break, not Christmas. You don't know what I'm talking about. That's the world you got. I remember when everybody cared. I remember when people used to say things like Merry Christmas to each other. Everybody said, Merry Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Lowenstein. <laughs> you know why? Because it wasn't about a religion. It was about something as a culture we thought was so valuable that we'd all do it together, even if I disagreed with the religion behind it because it was good for all instead of just me. But what do people say now? Happy holidays. <laughs> See, I just say happy holidays because I don't want to say Christmas because you don't believe in Christmas because I don't want to offend you. Because I... <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. This overuse of the word offensive is driving me out of my mind. I mean, excuse me, sir. Which part is more offensive, the peace on earth or the goodwill towards men rhetoric? It's such a disingenuous argument, it's not real. Oh yes, we want to say happy holidays because we don't want to leave anybody out, really. How come there's a ton of holidays in February? Nobody ever says happy holidays in February, do they? They say what it is, happy Valentine's. Oh, do you believe in love? <laughs> they don't care. Happy Valentine's is fine. Happy Hanukkah is fine. You see, that's what it's all about. In December, we've got two religious holidays, one cultural ho holiday and one holiday that I'm not sure what it is, Boxing Day. Ever seen that? December 26th, Boxing Day. What does it mean? Nobody knows. <laughs> Apparently, it's the day after Christmas. It must be all the fights we get in returning the junk we got the night before. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to return the fruitcake. We don't take it. <laughs> Happy Boxing Day! <laughs> but nobody wants 
to say Christmas, everything else but Christmas. Why? I know why. You do too. It's because it's got Christ in it. And after 2,000 years, he's still intimidating people. You see, when a religious person says, I'm the way, people don't want to hear it. They don't. They don't. And I want to say it to the rafters. I'm a, I've even seen Christian people not say Merry Christmas. There are people in China right now, Christians, who are in jail because they had a page of the Bible. And Christians in this country won't even say Merry Christmas. It amazes me, the cowardice. That's the price you pay when you're rich and safe. Airline industry still hasn't recovered. You know why? People aren't getting on planes. They're afraid. Think of that. We have traded safety and comfort for freedom. We're going to lose this country if we talk like that. I say you got to say Merry Christmas because it is. You don't believe in it? Fine. But I, I have a flash for you. Christianity happens to be the religious heritage of my country, whether you like it or not. Christianity happened to be the belief system of 99.9% .9 of the founding fathers, whether you like it or not. Every single founding father said that the Bible would be used as a fulcrum for the laws and ethics in this country, whether you like it or not. And they said it should be taught in school so kids would know where their ethics come from. So if you're not a Christian or you don't like it and you don't want Christmas celebrated, God bless you. But let me tell you something. If you think you're going to stop me from saying it because it offends you, hey, I got a flash for you. Put a helmet on. <laughs> it's my country too. It's amazing to me what's happening out there. But it's the worldview. It's the worldview that changes the way things are. And if you're in here right now, you're an atheist and you snuck in for a free show, let me tell you something. <laughs> Your holiday's coming. Your holiday's coming. You know what the second most popular holiday is in this country? Halloween. Yeah, that's how it works. Let's, let's weigh this out. Okay, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, and boom! Equally uplifting, don't you think, folks? <laughs> oh, by the way, have you ever noticed boo is the only scare word we know? It's the only thing you ever talk to scare people is the word boo. If you didn't know boo, we wouldn't know what to do. They'd open the door and you'd be like... <laughs> All we know is boo, and yet boo is not inherently scary. Watch. Boo, boo, boo. Nothing! <laughs> so why do people that say think they did something creative? Boo, gotcha. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, it's the fact you were hiding in the refrigerator. That's what got me. You could have said pretty much anything. Mikey Rancho. <laughs> what do you got me? I'm not a big fan of Halloween. I'm not afraid of Halloween. I'm not scared of Halloween. There's nothing on this earth that frightens me. I fear God only. But the thing that's interesting about Halloween is I think it's an inherently flawed holiday because it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Here's how it's supposed to work. Trick or treat. I tricked you. You got to give me candy. Woo! <laughs> the problem is I wasn't tricked. They always come on the same day. <laughs> I knew you were coming. No trick, hence no treat. <laughs> it's too popular. The only way trick or treat would work now is if you came like in May. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what is going on? Trick or treat. <laughs> you got me. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's a pickle. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different world. You. And worldviews matter. I have people that come up to me all the time and tell me about that. Oh, I don't believe in God. It doesn't hurt me. I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you are. Every decision a human being makes affects everybody else because your worldview of God, if he exists, makes you choose certain things. And those who say he does not exist makes you choose something else. And it affects everybody. You see, it makes people become fanatics. Oh, there's all the religious fanatics. Yes, there are. There's also animal rights fanatics. You've heard these people. The ones that have decided that they have the, all the answers. Don't wear fur. Well, that's fine for you. I'd like to wear fur. Don't wear fur! Well, I'd like an option, but you certainly... Be... <laughs> they bought... I just toy with these people. Yeah, I'm wearing fur underwear right now. <laughs> I got fur toys, fur car, fur house. I go to the store and they go paper plastic. I say fur! <laughs> they don't want you to wear fur, but they wear, they wear leather. Leather's dried meat for crying out loud. People spending five hundred dollars to wear beef jerky with a zipper. That's wrong. <laughs> I want fur. I need fur. Why? Because I don't have any. And I get cold. We're humans. We need fur. You take the hairiest man you've ever seen. Probably a Greek. <laughs> Put him next to a polar bear. That's Kojak right there, my friends. 
Come on, that's the way it is. You see, the worldview matters. And I'm not afraid. I, I, I'm not anti-animal. I'm pro-human. It's not people that care about animals that I care about. I think it's wonderful that people care about animals. What bothers me is people that think that animals and, and humans are equal. That's a problem. They'll actually say that they are equal and deserve rights. First off, you can't give a right to an animal. Why? Because a right is a philosophical concept based on the fact that you know you exist and know you can die. Animals aren't afraid to die. They're afraid of getting chased. <laughs> it's instinct. They keep going to the watering hole. The guys come after them, chase them away. They keep coming back time after time. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know what's... The bones aren't a giveaway, apparently. <laughs> They don't know what death is. Take a gun, stick it to a dog's head. It doesn't beg for its life. It licks it. <laughs> He's simply an animal, but we must be humane to the animals. Humane from human. I need to treat them like a human. Why? We got whales that end up on our beach. We'll spend a million dollars throwing them back. One of us fall out in the ocean. Let's see. The whales eat us. <laughs> eat them back. They're used to it. It's their way. <laughs> Honor their culture. But you see, people don't think that way because they don't understand, oh, we're all the same, and who are we to be speciesists? That's what they'll say, speciesists. It doesn't amaze me. I'm telling the people simply this. The very fact that we even talk about how we should treat animals proves we're better than they are because I guarantee you, animals in the Serengeti right now, they ain't having this conversation. <laughs> if it limps, it's lunch. That's how they play. You see, we care about people because we believe that people are intrinsically valuable if you're a theist, that God gave you value. See, the very people that we most care about, the children, oh, we must help the children. If somebody hurts a child, we think you're the worst person, should be thrown in jail. How about the elderly? If somebody hurts an elderly person, we think you're the worst kind of person. Throw them in jail, throw away the key, or the infirm. Anyone that's handicapped, if they're hurt, we think they should be thrown away. Think of that. Who do we most care about? The young, the old, the infirm, the same three categories animals choose when they go hunting. The young because they're inexperienced, the old because they're slow, the infirm because they can't get away. They hate them. They have no desire to give them grace or mercy because they're just food. That's why we're better than they are. That's all I'm trying to say. It's not that hard to figure out. They don't want to give you any kind of information like that. They don't want to do anything like that. They just want to tell you not to do it. Oh, you can't do that. You must be careful. If you care so much about the animals, go into the animal kingdom and teach them to be nice to each other first. Will somebody please help these wildebeests? There's like 500 wildebeest, one cheetah, they all scatter. Teach them to organize. You're much heavier and bigger than there's 500. Stop, circle the cheetah, dog pile on the cheetah. <laughs> but what do they do? Oh look, the cheetah's got old crippled Elmer. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Guess that makes more room at the watering hole. That's the way they are. And then they get mad at the people that hunt. Oh, you hunters, they can't stand you. We've got to stop the hunting, ban the honey. But they aren't even consistent. That's what bothers me about these people. They only care about the cute animals. Just the good looking ones. Oh, the spotted owls being harmed. Oh my goodness. Oh, look out there hurting the harp seal, the harp seal. Oh, dolphins are getting caught in the tuna net. This is my favorite. <gasps> stop, dolphins are getting caught in the tuna net. Dolphins are getting caught in the tuna net. Yeah, what about the tuna getting caught in the tuna net? <laughs> crazy about it. But tuna are fish, and fish are ugly. They never help the fish. People never chain themselves to a dock behind a carp. Never happens! <laughs> they don't care about the ugly ones. Yes, but dolphins are second to humans in intelligence. Really? Then tell the dolphins to go around! <laughs> Who came up with this idea they're so smart? I've seen dolphins at SeaWorld. They dance on their tail, bounce a ball on their nose, and go through flaming hoops of fire five shows a day, seven days a week for a sardine. <laughs> hey, Brainiac, get a union. <laughs> they don't like the fisher people. Can't stand you guys. No, we can't let this happen. We gotta go after the hunters. The hunters, you see, that's all I'm saying. If you're gonna go after hunters, you should go after the guys that catch fish. They're the most ruthless hunters I have ever seen. I mean, if I shoot it, it's dead. They'll catch this poor fish, battle it for 20 minutes, pull out of its environment, it's suffocating. Meanwhile, I'm taking pictures, showing around, hey, look what I did, hey, look what I did. Takes some pliers, rip the hook out of his face, and then throw him back. <laughs> if I'm a fish, I'm thinking, what was that all about? Eat me! <laughs> I got a big hole in my face now, thanks to you. I'm a freak. <laughs> Gotta join some fish sideshow. Hi, I'm Blowhole. <laughs> Honor their culture.
vulture and eat them up? Cry it out loud. And they just love their fish, man. I moved down south, man. They love fishing down here. You all love it. I've seen the fishing shows, man. Woo, he's a fighter. Woo, he's a fighter. He's a fighter. Look at him fight. He can fight. They don't like one verb. He's a fighter. Look at him fight. He can fight. He's a fighter. He's a fighter. If he's a can fight, look at him fight. Hey, he's really putting up a fight. I'm thinking, hey, Duddy, get a thesaurus. <laughs> I wrote in, they wrote back, dinosaurs are dead. But, uh, what? Okay. I'm kidding, he couldn't read. But the thing is, they always catch fish and they're proud, like they did something amazing. And especially with their lures, that's what they're proud of. He, I'm using me a Giglabob. Got me a Giglabob, using a Giglabob. It's always the same thing. It's a fake bug with a hook in it. They hit a hook in their food. Anybody would fall for that. I don't care how smart you are, man. Your mom makes you pancakes in the morning with a hook in it. You're going down, front row boy. <laughs> He'll be eating away. Hey, mom, good to <laughs> His mom will be at the griddle. He's a fighter. <laughs> Putting up a fight. I want consistency in this country. You want to be an animal rights activist? You have that ability. You have that right. We've given it to you. It's not yours. I'm getting so tired of people saying, I have the right, I have the right. No, you've been given the right. And it can be taken away. The right's been given to a lot of bigger, stronger people than you. We need America to be those type of people again that are willing to die for the country, that are willing to stand up to tyranny and say, if we have to go by ourselves, we will. And let you know that you do not walk on the greatest country on earth. So I want to see all the animal rights activists caring about all of them, just be consistent. Where's the bug rights activists? Where are the bug rights activists? Nobody cares about bugs, you know why? They're ugly. And stupid, I might add. They have no concept of windshields, do they folks? Man, after all these years, I keep smashing into that windshield. They don't know it's there. They don't learn from their mistakes. You've never hit the rear end of a bug. They're never running away. They don't know what's there. Think of that. They don't know what's there. It's class. And I gotta give them credit. They're courageous. All they see is your big fat head coming at them at 80 miles an hour and they're not backing down. Bring it on! <laughs> Come on, you swelled head freak. Come on! And then they hit that glass that they didn't know was there. Come on! <laughs> That's gonna take you by surprise. <laughs> when they tell the friends in bug heaven, how'd you die? I don't know. It's flying down the road and blew up. <laughs> All the bug scientists trying to get to the bottom of it. Apparently, some parts of the atmosphere appear to be more dense. <laughs> they don't understand glass and they can't learn because they're just bugs. You know, even if they're inside your car, they try to go out through the windshield. Come on, let's go over. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe if I go from a. Ah. They keep running. We get so frustrated, we try reasoning with bugs. Hey, 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 go out the window. <laughs> you can go through. <laughs> they don't know. And they don't get any stupider than flies. They gotta be the dumbest bug there ever was. Flies understand one concept, in. Open the door, what do they do? <laughs> 50 of them. Close the door, they're right on top of that thing. <laughs> Open it to let them out, what do they do? Oh no. <laughs> We're not falling for that again. <laughs> they don't get it. They're bugs. So care about them. Love them. Yes, that's why I'm a vegetarian, because I don't want to kill animals. Well, really, you shouldn't be a vegetarian, because I guarantee you, in harvest, you're killing some bugs. You can't eat anything to be a true humanitarian. Don't live in a house, you've got to be over some kind of ground that's probably hurting some bugs in a mole or two. <laughs> the only true way to care about animals as a human is to not exist. <laughs> Eliminate yourself, and then you'll truly be a humanitarian. <laughs> but they don't. They don't because they think it's wrong to hurt a bug or an animal and they've never taken two minutes to realize where the concept of wrong comes from. Because atheists don't have right or wrong, they'll say they do, but they're actually using borrowed capital from Christians. 
who created the idea of right and wrong when God Almighty said, you will not abuse children. Men and women are equal. Slaves will be set free. You will have hospitals to tend for those that you don't even know. This is a culture that has been changed because of one man, Jesus. He said, I'm going to change the world. And he did. And that's what I'm talking about, having a worldview that has repercussions, that people understand where they're going. And it's gotten so crazy in this country, we can't even interact anymore because everybody's too sensitive. Too sensitive nowadays, yes. I went to a Chinese restaurant. I love Chinese food. I love Chinese people. I love China. <laughs> I'm a China fan. <laughs> Old cult culture, they invented things, abacuses and gunpowder and good stuff, stuff we need. <laughs> if it wasn't for them, our 4th of July's would have been a lot less festive. Let's face it, folks, it would be like a... Woo! Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love Chinese people. I love Chinese food, so I went in to get some Chinese food, and I wanted to eat, and I was hungry. You know what they had for me to eat with? Chopsticks, and that's okay. It's a Chinese restaurant, but I said, you know what? I can't use them. I need a knife, a fork, and a spoon, and they didn't have any. Now, this is where I started getting a little testy. First off, do I look like I should be proficient with chopsticks? No, that's not against anybody. I don't know how to use them. I'm an American. I mean, matter of fact, every other ethnic restaurant I've ever been to has a knife, a fork, and a spoon. Every single one of them. And they've never expected me to be proficient in their cultural heritage. Never gone to an Italian restaurant yet, and they go, here's your spaghetti, but first, play the mandolin. <laughs> every restaurant always has a knife, a fork, and a spoon. You know why? Because we figured out that it's better than sticks. <laughs> That's why we gave up on sticks a couple thousand years ago. Cutlery is an upgrade. And I was upset, and the manager came over to me all indignant. We don't have silverware, we only have chopsticks, because we want to be authentic. <laughs> and I said, as a comedian, oh, you want to be authentic? Okay, let me get this straight, Bob. <laughs> I just walked into a Chinese restaurant in a strip mall in the United States of America. I walked brushed aluminum doors. I was met by a blonde woman that set me down at a Formica table and gave me a plastic laminated menu. I'm about to order Chinese food cooked by that Mexican guy in the back. And when I finish eating, I'm paying with a credit card. But you think if you throw in chopsticks, suddenly I'm propelled into the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> what delusion are you living in? I mean, you're gonna have to give me a chance to suspend my disbelief. Why stop at chopsticks? I'm gonna need a whole I reject modern technology theme day so I can be prepared. I wake up to the sound of a rooster outside of my window. I look down at the sundial to see what time it is. Then, taking my clothes down to the nearest stream, I'll beat them with a rock to get them nice and clean. Then I'll come back in and call a girl up and see if she wants to go to a Chinese restaurant. But I won't use a phone, I'll use a telegraph. Or better yet, smoke signals. Then, I'll go pick her up in my best Roman chariot. And once we get over there to eat, I'm not gonna pay with a credit card. I'm I'm gonna pay with three hands, a woven blanket, and some beads. And then when we go home, I'm not walking to the door, I'm hitting her over the head of the club and dragging her by the hair. Now when you throw in chopsticks, I get it! <laughs> now, I love that joke. I'll tell you why. First off, I love watching the faces of all the people going, man, you're taking this chopsticks thing a little too seriously, don't you think? <laughs> And the answer is, yes. I'm taking it way too seriously. That's why it's funny. It's called satire, sarcasm, using a ridiculous scenario to make a finer point. Why do I tell you that? Because I did this show at a chapel at Pepperdine University. And then I was hired to do another show later on down the road, and I was fired. And I called the booker up and said, what happened? Been fired. Why? You did the chopsticks joke. <laughs> and I said, yes, but if you listen to the chopsticks, it's, it's just simply me making fun of the fact I can't use them. And I just figured, you know, we should be using silverware right now. We're Americans. I'll never forget what the guy said. He said, yes, but you said that silverware was better than chopsticks. Now, I try to be honest, folks. I'm not perfect. I can make mistakes. My religion demands me to try to always be better and grow. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I don't want to offend people. <laughs> I did say that silverware 
was better than chopsticks because it is! <laughs> Obviously, a knife, a fork, and a spoon is better than chopsticks. Oh, you're just being ethnocentric. Obviously, a knife, a fork, and a spoon in tandem are better than chopsticks. You're just being bigoted and intolerant and insensitive. Oh, for crying out loud. Here's a bowl of soup, here's some chopsticks, here's a spoon. Let's see who gets to the bottom first. <laughs> If you like to use chopsticks, fine. But if you think that everybody should learn how to use them and you don't understand why I'm so crazy, put a helmet on! <laughs> See, two kids got out of the show and wouldn't complain. They wouldn't complain. And I got fired. I'm not gonna tell you the ethnicity of these two kids. <laughs> but you can pretty much rule out their last name was Rodriguez. And that's okay, I mean, they have the right to do that. But here's why I bring it up. Because after the show, a young black man came up to me, he said, thank you for your show, it really made me think. Another guy came up to me, he said, I'm a vegan, the most radical form of vegetarian. He said, I, I thought your animal rights stuff was funny. Another girl came up to me and said, hey, I'm gonna start wearing fur now, kind of joking. Another guy said, hey, you should be a libertarian. Another kid came up to me and said, will you come speak at our Young Republicans convention? Unsolicited. I had all these different ideologies, cultures, and religions, politics come up to me and tell me, thank you. A black guy, a vegan, a Republican, a libertarian, a girl. <laughs> Representing the whole of America and all the kids that never got to see a show and get to make their own choices because two people were offended by something that isn't offensive. I don't call that sensitivity, I'll call it censorship. And so a university that is supposed to be teaching kids all types of thought, even dissenting viewpoints, took the high road and fired me. Shame on you, Pepperdine. I'm not here, my friends, to hurt anybody's feelings. But if you are unable, let me tell you something. You want to truly know if you have an immature character, you can tell by this rule how difficult it is for you to laugh at yourself. That's just immaturity. And if you cannot discern the difference between somebody being malicious towards your ethnicity and somebody finding humor in the differences, put a helmet on! <laughs> We've got to laugh again. We've got to laugh again because we are different. I'd rather laugh about it than fight about it. You see, we used to be able to. We used to be able to. But I told you I was a theist, and I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm just a follower. I don't call myself a Christian rarely because the first church never did. They call themselves the way or followers of the way. Christianity was, the word Christian was given to them later, and it was actually a derogatory term. I'm just a follower of Jesus. He's way up there, and I'm just trying to catch up. <laughs> I'm just stopping half the time. Go ahead, Lord, I'm bushed. <laughs> I'm staying back here and stumbling for a minute. Go ahead. I just follow. But I also believe that this is a great and powerful belief system. And I want us to be able to talk about it to other people in an intelligent way. An intelligent way. And we're always looking for ways to be dis against each other. When I was growing up in a church, they told me Catholics were all going to hell. All the Catholics are going to hell because they see Mary everywhere. Look, Mary's in the side of the road. Look at her. Mary's in a toaster. Look at that. Mary's in a tortilla. Run, run. <laughs> and it's true. Catholics see Mary everywhere. Protestants see Satan everywhere. <laughs> oh, Satan's in my radio. Satan made me lose my job. No, your incompetence made you lose your job. <laughs> Ever seen these people that always blame Satan for everything that happens in their life? If he did anything, he pretty much just woke them up that morning. They took it from there. Everybody's always looking for a place for Satan to show up, some weird place that Satan's, Satan's going to show up. When I was growing up, it was backward masking. Backward masking. Satan's everywhere. Oh, he's going to be in the backwards records. Backwards records in the 80s, new age. Satan's in the new age. In the 90s, it was something, I'm sure. I don't know what it was. 
Now it's Harry Potter books. Now it's Harry Potter books. Harry Potter books! Don't even touch the cover of the Harry Potter book! I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a church had a Harry Potter book burning. Let me tell you something. I believe as a believer in Jesus that everything you do is supposed to drive people to the cross and not away. And let's face it, nothing makes people come through the doors of a church like a good old-fashioned book burden, huh, folks? <laughs> Use your mind. Think about people, how they perceive you. Anything you're about to do, you should think about the method first before you do it. And I think a good rule of thumb is if Hitler tried it, <laughs> maybe go another direction. But I believe that intelligence should bring you to the precipice of faith, that this is not a, reli a, a religion of ridiculousness that we're just trying to find some way out, but that religion can teach you why you're here and it can get you to that place where faith makes sense. So that's why when I see Christians acting stupid, I say it. Backward masking, 16, you know what I'm talking about. They said if you took certain rock and roll records, certain rock and roll, you're 16, records are like giant CDs. <laughs> Now we got CDs, so apparently Satan's in hell going, now what are we gonna do? <laughs> I get some Japanese demons on this technology immediately. <laughs> Satan can't even do that, he'd hit a horn. CDs! Oh. <laughs> See, that's where he is, that's where he was. They said, if they said, if you took certain rock and roll records, here's what they told me, and you play them backwards, as so many of us tend to do. <laughs> Excuse me, if you're starting to play your records backwards, perhaps you deserve to hear a message from Satan. <laughs> He's probably just giving instructions. It's going the wrong way. <laughs> You've got to use your mind. If words backwards were evil, all words backwards would be evil. Dallas, Texas, people would be dropping dead from vegetables. Coincidence? No, not when you realize Dallas backwards is salad. <laughs> Only half you got that. Good, okay. <laughs> Only half the people in Virginia get joked. Coincidence? No, not when you realize Virginia backwards is a... <laughs> Catalina. Most people in Catalina have spastic colons. Coincidence? No, not when you realize Catalina backwards is anal attack. See that right there? Should give you some information. We got a couple people. You can't say that in church, I don't believe. That's what they said. <laughs> Satan's there. We become lazy in this country as Christians. I knew we were getting lazy in this country when we started putting handles on our Bibles. <laughs> There's like Christians in the, all around the world trying to hide their Bibles. We got like, my Bible's too heavy. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this handle. It makes it easier, but could it be possible that you could fashion some holy handlebars so I could steer my Bible? And perhaps a wheel and a saddle, like I might bring it in, come in early, and lay it down on the pew or between two seats so I can save them. That way I can leave and go to Starbucks and get a double latte cappuccino frappe so I can stay awake for the second service. <laughs> we got 50 Bibles a piece. We don't even know the books of them. We got to have tabs showing us where everything is. Where's Genesis? Where's Genesis? <laughs> the early church had scrolls. You imagine that? Big old scrolls, hang them on your back, or chafing you everywhere you go. <laughs> if they were new, you'd open up, they'd slam shut on you, it'd be embarrassing. <laughs> People trying to make a living, trying to be a good witness, let me talk to you about the Lord. Okay, if you look right here in Habakkuk. <laughs> Habakkuk, 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 I don't know how you pronounce it. You don't either, you haven't read it either. What are you talking about? <laughs> I believe in Jesus. I believe in him. And there's a lot of people that don't, and that's, he gives you the right to do that. But I just want you to know that faith does have purpose and value, and it can be used intellectually. And people say, yes, what's the difference, you know? The Bible's just another book. No, first off, that's wrong. The Bible's not a book. The Bible's 66 books. 40 different people wrote it. Over 1,500 years. There's never been a book like that in history. 
ever. Does that make it the word of God? No. It just means it's worth considering because there's never been a book like this. Gives you some reason to consider it over the others. Well, how about history? For hundreds of years, archaeology has used the Old Testament and new to find buildings, to find people, to find civilizations, to find kings that didn't exist or they didn't think they did. And suddenly the Bible said they're there and they dug it up and there it was. Does that make it the word of God? No. It means it's historically accurate. Real people really existed and really wrote down what they saw. It's worth considering. And then they said, we're going to have God show up. And lots of people said that. Lots of religions say it. Don't worry, we'll prove it as a rational God would do. I will do prophecies. I will show that I'm not trapped in linear time, that I can see beyond where you are. I will give prophecies to tell you what the guy, when I show up, when God appears on earth to reveal himself, I'll show you what he's going to look like. Over 300 prophecies. And then a man showed up one day named Jesus. And he said, I'm that guy. And he fulfilled all 300 prophecies. That's impossible. People could say, well, yes, uh, they just wrote it afterwards and filled it all in. But we know that the first Greek translation of the Old Testament was done 250 years before Jesus was born. So how could they possibly know that he'd be born in Bethlehem? How could they possibly know he was going to be crucified when crucifixions didn't even exist as a capital punishment yet? How could they know that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver 250 years before there was a Jesus? Does it make it the word of God? No, but it's starting to get close. And then Jesus said he would fulfill these things and did miraculous things to prove I'm not just a guy talking like everybody else. Look what I've done. And some people believed and some didn't. That's how humans are. And then he said this, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to die. And I'm going to come back to life. <coughs> Nobody's ever done that. And he died. And all those who were with him, three years, ran in fear as would all of us. And they ran away and they said, I guess it, we were wrong. And then something happened. Something happened that made all of these guys come back and be willing to be martyred for this belief system, except for one. Of course, he was, John was sent off, but everybody died a martyr's death. What was it for? Because they thought they were going to get rich. There was no riches here, there was no riches. The Roman government hated them. They wanted them destroyed. They'd use them as, as people that could be eaten alive by animals for sport and entertainment. You were kicked out of your culture. The Jews weren't going to take you in. So there was no value there. There was nothing good here. There was nothing here to gain. And they all still died for what? Because they found a new religion? No, for one reason. They said this. I saw him die. And I saw him come back. And that's it. You don't have to believe that. And why didn't he die so he could have a perfect life? No, so you didn't have to go to hell. Well, I don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. He didn't give hell for you. That's what's great about Christianity. It gives you all the answers. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. But it was part of the rules he put into nature, into the nature that, that we live in. That anybody that would bail against him, this is where they're going. So once we did that, he could have bailed out. Sorry, you're going to hell. He did, and he said, don't worry, kids, I'm coming down. So if you go to hell, you chose it. And you will not sit there and argue with him. You'll know what you've done. And if you're an atheist, let me tell you something. That's your dilemma. If we all die and there is no... No God, it's just eternal unconsciousness. You'll never know. But if you're wrong, you'll know forever. And it's not a gamble anybody should take. Well, what are you saying? I should just believe in Jesus so I don't go to hell? Pretty much. <laughs> God bless you, everybody. Thank you. The truth is marching on. Oh, come on, are you 
CNN. That's what I'm saying. Oh, stop it. And then that thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I, I think it was Einstein that said, the more I see the universe, the more I see myself, and the more I look at myself, the more I realize I could use a comb. And <laughs> if you're not laughing, get any picture of Albert Einstein. <laughs> Arguably the, arguably, the greatest thinker of the 20th century found combing his hair too complex. <laughs> Savant, we don't know, but there's a lot of things we don't know. If you drop soap on the floor, does it get dirty? <laughs> Can't wash it off, it's already so. <laughs> if you get dental floss caught in your teeth, what do you use to get it out? <laughs> Popcorn, maybe, or? <laughs> the sign says, thank you for not smoking. How did it know? Shouldn't dyslexia actually be pronounced slexdesia? <laughs> that way people that have it would know what they had. <laughs> if vegetarians can only eat vegetables, that means they could eat meat if the cow was brain dead. <laughs> Got a couple ranchers going, good idea right there. <laughs> Vegetarian beef! If somebody's legally blind and suddenly can see, are they breaking the law? <laughs> if your friend says, I'm going outside to get some air, what was he breathing inside? <laughs> and finally, if somebody can actually scare the hell out of you, shouldn't you be grateful? I'm grateful of you people for coming out. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a closing prayer. If anyone here tonight would like to know how to be born again, you've come just this special time and you believe Christ died for you, was buried for you, rose from the dead for you, you just come on down afterwards and meet us here. We'll be here to talk with you. You know what about. And God bless you and let's bow together and thank God our evening together. Our Father, we dedicate all that has happened here tonight to your glory. And may the seed of God planted in every heart grow up into fruition with Christ being glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>